good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thanks for coming out, uh, those that are here in the room, and thank you for joining online as well. Really appreciate that. Um, my name is Dr. Brett Zimmerman. I'm one of the Lakeside Physician OBGYNs. I'm affiliated with Lake Granberry Medical Center as well. Um, we're here to talk about cervical health. So I have a few slides here um, that we'll run through uh, briefly, and then we'll have plenty of time for discussion and questions at the end. Um, and without further ado, let's get started here. Um, so cervical cancer is, a, is kind of a tricky one because it, it is a global problem, but it's not as big of a problem in the United States. And we'll, we'll talk about why that is in a second, but um, there's about 600,000 cases a year globally um, and about, only about 12,000 in this country. So again, it's a worldwide problem, but in the U.S. it's, it's less of a problem. Thankfully, being in the U.S., you are significantly less likely to die of cervical cancer if you live here as opposed to somewhere else in the world, <clears throat> maybe an underdeveloped country. And most of that is really about access to care. So if you think about maybe some rural sub-Saharan African countries where there is, where you're 250 miles from the nearest anything, you're not likely to get the health care that you need or the screening that you need for cervical cancer. So you're more likely, 50% likely to die of cervical cancer. So it's a bad one for sure to have if you do get it. Um, but thankfully here, <coughs> you're a little bit better off. Unfortunately, Texas has one of the highest cervical cancer rates in the country. And that's all along the south, the southeast, and Montana. And I can see Montana, and if you think about the way Montana is, there's, it's open and rural, and maybe they don't have, the people there don't have the access to care that, that some of the more populated areas um, like New Jersey might have. So we have one of our uh, uh, people in the audience here who's from New Jersey, so shout out to New Jersey. All right, so cervical cancer is mostly diagnosed in, in your 30s and 40s, but the average age is 50 when women are diagnosed. It is very rare to see a cervical cancer under age 20 or over age 65. And we'll talk about that as well. And that, that goes along with how, how and who we screen. <clears throat> you can see this picture here um, that I have up. This is on the right side there. There's, there's kind of an anatomy uh, picture. Uh, on the lower right, this is what we see when we use a speculum for a speculum exam during your well woman exam. It, the cervix kind of looks like a donut. And cervical cancer is abnormal cells on that cervix. And sometimes you can see it and sometimes you cannot. Um, but when those cells on the surface of the cervix turn into precancer and then cancer, that's, that's kind of how it goes with cervical cancer. There's also some glands inside the cervix and those can also get a cancer. Um, there, essentially there's two different types of, of cervical cancer. One is the outer layer that's called squamous. That's the same type of cells you have on your skin of your arm. It's the skin of the cervix. And then inside are the glandular cells and those, um, those can also get a, a, a develop cancer as well. A lot less common. About 20% of the cervical cancers are the glandular type. There are definitely some risk factors associated with cervical cancer. And we'll, we'll talk about this in, in a lot more detail, but uh, human papillomavirus is the big one. All 99.99% of cervical cancers are caused by HPV. It stands for human papillomavirus, <clears throat> and it is the virus that causes cervical cancer. It is a sexually transmitted virus. Um, there is... Uh, there may be a few cancers that are not caused by HPV, but if you essentially do the deep dive, it probably was HPV related anyway. So by far and away, this is the risk factor. If you've been exposed or have HPV, you are at risk for cervical cancer. Some other risk factors are um, if you've had uh, sex at a young age, and most of the studies define that as under 18, and really, it, Risk factors are about immune function and exposure to HPV. <clears throat> so if you think about someone who's had sex at a young age, you're more likely to be exposed to HPV. Um, the same thing goes with multiple sex partners. So if you've been with more than one person in your life, you are at higher risk of being exposed to HPV more, uh, more frequently. Same goes with your partner. If your partner has had multiple partners in the past, there is a higher risk of exposure to HPV. 
uh, one of the big immune functions is about smoking. So if you are a smoker, it's associated with cervical cancer because your immune system doesn't work as well when you're a smoker. So what happens is when you're exposed to HPV, and of course HPV is, is necessary for cervical cancer, but smoking contributes because it allows the HPV to make changes in your cervix. It concentrates in the cervical mucus and, and allows that virus to make those changes in the cervix. Um, also, HIV, um, people infected with HIV have immune problems, so they're more likely to uh, get cervical cancer as well. <clears throat> These are the ones that we um, that were, are a little more surprising and they're more associations, but if you are poor, you're more likely to get cervical cancer than if you're wealthy, and, and that's probably about access to care as well. If you don't have the access to getting proper screening or vaccinations, then you're more likely to get cervical cancer. If you have been on birth control pills for a long period of time, that is associated with cervical cancer. The reason that is, it's not the birth control pills themselves that cause cancer, it's that when you are on the pill, you're less likely to use protection, you use a condom during intercourse. So your exposure to HPV, you can see the theme here, it's exposure to HPV that increases your risk for cervical cancer. Uh, history of chlamydia. If you've, if you've been exposed to one STD, you're more likely to be exposed to another. And we, we talked about this with the people in the crowd here today. A diet low in fruits and vegetables is associated with having cervical cancer. And again, it's not necessarily a cause and effect. It's just an association. And that may be related to economic status. So if you're poor, you're less likely to have a well-balanced diet. If you don't have a well-balanced diet, your immune function is not going to be as good. So there are some steps in between there, but uh, just an association with cervical cancer. If you were born between 1938 and 1971, uh, there was a medication called diethylstilbestrol, DES, um, which was given to women who to prevent miscarriage. So a woman would come in knowing she's pregnant, having some bleeding, this medication was given to some of those women. Um, it got taken off the market because there was lots of problems with it. It didn't work for one and two, there was lots of downstream effects to getting this medication diethylstilbestrol. So it was the offspring of those women that were given DES that have the problems and they have the risk factor for, for cervical cancer. Common theme here. HPV. Cervical cancer is all about HPV. And like I said earlier, almost all, if not all, cervical cancers are caused by human papillomavirus. The unfortunate part is it's hard to avoid. 80% of the population has been or is exposed to HPV. So if you're sexually active, which most people in this world are at some point in their lives, you have the chance of being exposed to HPV. Now, there's only 12,000 cases of HPV or of cervical cancer in this country, yet 80% of the population, so of our 350 million people, some 250 or whatever million people should have cervical cancer, but they don't. Only 12,000 do. So having HPV is not a foregone conclusion to get cervical cancer. It's just what is the predisposing factor to get it if you're going to get it. And there's lots of steps in between there. Um, with precancers and abnormal pap tests, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but having HPV doesn't mean you're going to get cervical cancer. It's just the biggest risk factor. There are over a hundred different subtypes of HPV. Uh, some of them cause warts on your finger or, or planter's warts on your feet or genital warts or cervical cancer. <clears throat> and there's some higher risk um, subtypes of HPV, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit as well because that's what we test for when we're screening for cervical cancer are those high-risk subtypes of HPV. What are the signs and symptoms of cervical cancer? Well, when someone comes into my office and they say they're having bleeding after intercourse, my ears perk up and say we need to rule out cervical cancer. That's the, the biggest, the most common symptom is bleeding after intercourse. But there's some others that are associated as well. A, a watery or bloody discharge, especially if it has a foul odor to it, that can be related to cervical cancer as well. There's some other things that are associated, other symptoms that are associated with it that are 
more likely to be caused by something else, but something uh, that can be part of the picture, picture with cervical cancer, and that's irregular menstrual bleeding, pelvic pain, pain with intercourse. Well, more likely than not, that's caused by something else as opposed to cervical cancer, but it can be all part of what we look for when we're trying to figure it out. <clears throat> now we're gonna get into screening and prevention. Is cervical cancer preventable? 100% yes, it is. If you've never ever been sexually active in your entire life with no genital touching of any kind, you're not likely to get cervical cancer. Not likely for 99.9% .9 of the population. But vaccination is also a way to prevent cervical cancer. There is a, there is a vaccine and we'll talk about that in more detail in the next slide. Um, and then we'll also talk about how we screen for it. So the, the, first, the first cervical cancer vaccine, uh, it's actually a vaccine against HPV, came out in 2006. It's called Gardasil. And when they, the, the first vaccine was what we call a quadrivalent vaccine, which protect against, protected against four of the subtypes of HPV. Two that were associated with cervical cancer and two that were associated with genital warts. So that was the first vaccine. Shortly thereafter, another uh, company came out, Cervix, <clears throat> that was uh, uh, um, protected against two of the cervical cancer-causing HPV subtypes of the virus. And now Gardasil has one that's a nine valent, so it protects against nine different subtypes of HPV. And those are the ones that are most common, the most common cause. So when we look at all cervical cancers and analyze all cervical cancers, they're more likely caused by these, these seven subtypes of the virus because there's the two in the um, vaccine that protect against genital warts as well. There's multiple subtypes that, that can predispose you to genital warts, but there's two of the most common. So we try and hit those with vaccines. It is given to mostly young boys and girls, the vaccine. So we try and vaccinate boys and girls between nine and 12, and presumably they're not sexually active at that time. And that's why you want to give the vaccine at that time to prevent the exposure, or not prevent the exposure, but prevent the actual acquire, acquiring of the virus when they do eventually become sexually active. Um, the studies were done age nine to 26, and you know why is 26 a cutoff for a vaccine? That's what they studied. But if you think about where someone is in their life at age 27 or 30, they're more likely to be married than they are in their, when they're 22. And they're more likely to be in a, in a stable relationship when they're 22. So the, the best bang for your buck from a vaccination standpoint is from age nine to 26. Um, vaccination programs work best if the entire population that's eligible is vaccinated. So works a lot better if we vaccinate everybody, boys and girls. First, when it first came out, we thought just vaccinating the girls was gonna be of benefit, but boys are eligible too. And most of these are done in the pediatrician's office. Now, can someone who is 27 to 45, and, for, and we'll talk about 45, age 45 in a second, but can someone who is 27 to 45 get vaccinated against HPV? The short answer is yes. If someone comes into my office and they say, I'm 30 years old, I wanna be vaccinated, vaccinated against HPV. Almost always I'm gonna say, okay, great. Yes, let's do it. It may not do any good, but it's certainly not gonna hurt anything. Um, <clears throat> and the reason that we are less likely to vaccinate in that age group is that you're probably most likely exposed already to HPV, so it may not do any good. But someone comes in and, you know, age 35 or so, and they've been in a monogamous relationship in the, their entire lives up until then, and they have a life change to get divorced or something, and and now want to pr pursue other relationships, they'd be a good candidate for, for vaccination because it's less likely that they have been exposed to HPV. So they would, they would benefit from being vaccinated. Now, over 45, that's about exposure as well. Less likely to have it do any good. So um, ex um, vaccinating people, uh, women or men older than 45 is very, very unusual. Does it work? It absolutely works. You can see here that since we started vaccinating 
um, people across the board, HPV infections have dropped by 80%. And again, you gotta have HPV to get cervical cancer. So we've dropped those infections by 80%. You think about the flu shot. The flu shot is like 40 or 50% effective, depending on the year. And with this HPV vaccine, it's 80% effective. So it's, it's been a real success story. Cervical precancers, which we'll talk about in a little bit as well, have dropped by 40%. So there's a succession that one goes through um, when it comes to cervical cancer. Exposure to HPV changes are caused in the cervix leading to a precancer. Those precancerous cells over time can turn into a cancer. And we'll discuss that more in a little bit. This is just about the vaccines here. I don't need to rehash that. Um, side effects with any vaccine really is about immune function. So the way vaccines work is you, you give a, a particle of some sort that goes into the body and your immune system then mounts antibodies to it. Then when, you're, when you are exposed to that virus, having since the body was exposed to maybe a piece of that virus, it doesn't cause an infection, but since you're exposed to a piece of that virus, then when the actual virus um, is introduced in the body, the immune system can fight it off. That's how most all vaccines work. And that's how um, the HPV vaccine works as well. But there's side effects, pain, fever, low grade temp, feel fatigued, you might feel a little nausea. The biggest thing is when we first started doing this vaccine, we found that young girls passed out when they got it. Don't know why. Most protocols, when you get a vaccine in the office in a, in a teenage girl or a young girl, you have them lay down when they, when they get the vaccine uh, so they don't pass out and hit their head. So, And we don't know exactly what the mechanism of that is. So the, the backbone of prevention, in addition to vaccination, is screening for cervical cancer. <clears throat> and that's where a pap test will come in. And cervical cancer screening is a, is a bit different than breast cancer screening. Cervical cancer is way better than breast cancer screening because we can pick up a precancer or an abnormality before it ever turns into cancer. Breast cancer screening is about detecting early cancers. So when you get a mammogram or an MRI or however you get screened, it's about detecting smaller cancers than you might be able to feel, whereas cervical cancer is is a detection of a precancer before it ever turns into a cancer. And that's the huge benefit to cervical cancer screening. The, the only people really that we diagnose cervical cancer in are those that don't get screened. Um, if you are getting your screening done on a regular basis, and we'll talk about how, how often you should be screened in a little bit, but uh, I've, I've never seen a cervical cancer that, that was diagnosed in someone who gets their pap test on a regular basis. So how do, we, how do we figure out when to test and, and who to test and who to screen for cervical cancer? Well, there's, there's lots of societies that put out guidelines. Um, that top one there is ACOG, that's the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology. <clears throat> that is the, that's the society that most OBGYNs follow. All of these recommendations, ACS stands for the American Cancer Society, USPSTF stands for the United States Preventative Services Task Force, they put out guidelines as well. They're all a little bit different. There's nuances to all of the recommendations. They're all probably right in one way or another, but for instance, the American College of Obstetrics, Obstetrics and Gynecology says you should start getting a pap test at age 21. The American Cancer Society says age 25. So it's a little bit different depending on how those societies interpret the science, interpret the data, is, is how they put out their guidelines. So, but most, if you go into the OBGYN's office, you'll probably, um, the, almost all of them follow the ACOG guidelines. So we'll talk about the ACOG guidelines because I'm biased because I'm an OBGYN. Um, so cervical cancer screening starts at age 21. And back when I started in training back in the 90s, um, we screened everybody. If you came into the clinic and you were 16 and you were sexually active, you got a pap test. With data and time and figuring out how HPV works and how it, how it relates to cervical cancer and causes cervical cancer, we figured out that that was not necessary. Even if somebody is sexually active when they're 16, 
and maybe they are exposed to HPV at that time. By the time they're 21, their, their body has probably fought it off. So you screen at 21 and they have a normal pap test. So 21 is when, is when you start. You might go into your family doctor and they might say, oh, you don't need a pap test till you're 25, which is still right. They're just following the American Cancer Society guidelines. When you uh, are screened between age 21 and 29, um, there's uh, an option for, for screening. And a pap test, what it does is you, you take a sample of the cells off the cervix. And the traditional pap test was you put those cells on a slide and looked at it under a microscope. And you saw if those cells were normal or abnormal. And there's various stages of abnormalities on, on the pap test. That's the cytology. That's the cell portion of the pap test. Now, since we figured out HPV was related to cervical cancer, we also can test for HPV. Now, if you're 21 to 29, we don't routinely test for HPV. You just do the, the cells, the cytology. Um, and the reason is, is because you may be exposed, but by the time you're 30, you probably have suppressed it with your immune function. So once you hit 30, that's when you start getting standard HPV testing. But there are options that you can have when you, when you are screened over 30. You can get that, the cytology. You can't just get the cells looked at every three years. Um, it's also acceptable just to have HPV testing every five years. The thing that's done the most, the way that people are screened from 30 to 65, the most is by cytology of the cells as well as HPV testing automatically. When you've had both of those tests done and you've had normal tests all along, you can get screened every five years. If you're under 30, it's every three years. So that's kind of the standard. It, I, I think a lot of people are used to, I go in and get my exam done and I get a pap test every year. Not necessary. It's, the pap test is just a small portion of the whole exam, the whole pelvic exam and the whole uh, health care visit, really. Um, if there are dangers to, to testing too often because even if you're exposed to HPV, You'll often clear it on your own. So if you do it every five years instead of every year, you may have avoided a colposcopy which, uh, and biopsies, which we'll get to in a second as well. So just to review, no screening under 21, 21 to 29 every three years, 30 to 65 every five years. We stop screening at 65. No need, and we talked about that a little bit earlier. There's very, 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 very few cervical cancers that are diagnosed in women over 65. That being said, if you've had severe precancer, you have to have screening 25 years after your diagnosis. So if you have severe precancer in your 20s, you'll still be done by 65. If you were first diagnosed at age 50 with severe precancer, you still need 25 years. So if you're 50, you might have to go to 75 to be screened. Um, but all, all normal, never had an abnormal, never had dysplasia, you can be screened every five years and no longer screened after 65. If you've had a hysterectomy, no reason to do cervical cancer screening at all. There's no cervix, typically. So most hysterectomies are done by taking the uterus and the cervix out. And if that's the case, for cervical cancer screening, you don't need a pap test. The caveat to that one is if you have had cervical cancer or if you've had severe pre-cancer, you still need some screening for that 25 years at the top of the vagina where the cervix used to be um, uh, despite not having had a cervix. But I, uh, I see plenty of women who come in who've had a hysterectomy, say they want their pap tests, and I get to say, no, you don't need one. So no cervix, no cervical cancer screening needed generally. So I think this is surprising for a lot of people is because a lot of women are just used to getting it every year. And that's the way it was done about, I'd say the, the recommendations changed about 10-ish years ago maybe um, to go every five years for, for women over 30 and to three years for, for women under 30. So you can see on this slide, this is the the words on the right are a bunch of the abnormalities that can come up from a pap test. And the picture on the left is the algorithm that we follow 
with just one of those abnormalities. So each one of those abnormalities has its own algorithm. So it is complex. It is very complex. So I personally have an app on my phone that so I don't have to memorize every single step of this of this algorithm because the the recommendations do change sometimes. And when that happens, the app stays up to date and I can make sure that I'm on the right track with um, what I do for screening. So each one of those abnormalities on the right has a has an algorithm that goes along with it. So what if you do have an abnormal pap test? What next? And, and the short answer, it depends. What the abnormality is and if you've had it before. So sometimes it, it just will mean that you need some extra surveillance with another pap test more frequently than every three years or every five years. And sometimes that means going to a diagnostic procedure. The, the diagnostic procedure after you have an abnormal pap test that requires it is something called a colposcopy. And you can see this uh, provider here on the right, she's got this microscope looking thing. And that's really what it is. It's, it's a microscope that magnifies the cervix. We put special solutions on the cervix that allow us to see those abnormal cells on the cervix if they're there or not. Then once we do see that, you may have a biopsy associated with it. Um, and that can be either a biopsy on the outside or one from those glandular cells on the inside of the cervix. This is kind of a, a, a little bit of a review, but the, the largest benefit of pap testing is that we can pick up precancer before it ever turns into cancer. That's been the huge benefit of this, and that's what has precipitously dropped cancer cases in this country and developed nations. Again, there's, there's areas that don't have the resources that we have that still have a, a large problem with cervical cancer, but pap testing significantly dropped the, the cases of cervical cancer in this country. And again, an abnormal pap test sometimes just requires some extra surveillance with a more frequent pap test than, than you might need under normal circumstances, and sometimes it does, uh, um, it does require uh, a diagnostic procedure. The, your body's immune function, and um, we talked about smoking, we talked about a healthy diet, that's, that's really the only thing that we know of that can help with your immune function against HPV as well. If you're healthy otherwise, exercise, eat right, sleep right, have a good diet, you help your immune function and that helps fight off HPV. Smoking is the other thing. Again, if you're a smoker, quit or don't ever start because that does affect immune function as well and your risk of, of cervical cancer and HPV. Unfortunately, no medications will treat HPV or, or prevent HPV except the vaccination, but there, once you have HPV and are diagnosed with it, you can't take a medication, you can't put a solution, you can't put a cream on it or anything that, that's going to get rid of it with any, with any success. Um, Again, stop smoking or don't ever start. Once you have an abnormality or a precancer that's diagnosed, then the treatment involves um, an excisional procedure. And an excisional procedure just makes, make, means taking those abnormal cells off that we do find. Um, you can see here that the most common, the most common excisional procedure is something called a LEAP. It's essentially a, a loop. It's a little electric knife that kind of shaves off those abnormal cells because those those abnormal cells and precancers concentrate or focus right in the center of the cervix where, where there's those two different types of cells. Um, and that's the way that you uh, take those cells off. And that can be done as an office procedure. A conization is somewhat like a leap, but it's a, it's a bigger procedure. It's more of a piece of the cervix than, than the leap is. And that's usually done in the hospital. Uh, Corollary to that is there. There are some some women that get a precancer and it's treated with a leap. And there's time over time they continue to get it back. And it probably is about immune function. Um, hysterectomy is also a, a viable alternative to treatment for for this because then you're taking the cervix out. You no longer have that spot where where those cells focus and the HPV focuses its changes. Summary. Odds and ends, again, HPV, difficult to avoid. Um, if you are sexually active, ever been sexually active, chances are you've been exposed to one or more subtypes of the virus. Vaccination works, 
all vaccination programs work best if everybody's vaccinated that's eligible so I recommend getting kids vaccinated in that 9 to 12 age group. You don't need a pap test every year. Pap test is a small portion of the yearly women's exam. Um, screening uh, on a regular basis is necessary but unnecessary to be done every year with the caveat that it's all been done. <coughs> Once, once, you're, once you have an abnormal one, then you're on a different algorithm, a different path. The only women that we diagnose cervical cancer in are those that don't get screened on, the, on a regular basis or a routine basis. <clears throat> the, one of the biggest questions I get when someone has an abnormal pap test or has a HPV, vac or HPV uh, infection or, um, yeah, essentially an abnormal pap test is, how did I get this? Where did I get this? Well, if you've had sex with one partner your entire life and that person has had sex with, with you only, I can tell you who you got it from. If not, you can't tell. You, you, could, have, you could have a partner that you got exposed to HPV early on in life and now it's only coming out in your 30s or 40s. It does happen. We just can't really tell. So that's a common question that I get asked is uh, where did I get this, so.